And that is just going... Well, f*** that up. Everyone has been destroyed because of this freak. I won't allow it! These babies just saved this lame fest party! Canada Day, everybody. That is right. This is our Canada Day weekend spectacular. And by spectacular, I mean it's supposed to be the last show where I'm just flying solo. So Birdman and I should be back together for the, I guess, 4th of July weekend show at the end of the week. Um, We've got friends coming up and we're going to be hanging out and doing a bunch of crap. But in the meantime, we wanted to make sure we had a show out for the weekend. So uh, we've got, uh, it's a bit of a condensed show. We're not doing a uh, Satan's Pantry or on the buses segment. It's going to be a few reviews, uh, a quick some quick news, some weird news, and then wham bam, thank you, ma'am. We are done for the weekend, so we can go out and barbecue and and celebrate in this nice boiling hot weather. <laughs> so here's the lowdown for the show this week. Uh, right after this, we have a review of Achtun uh, Cthulhu from. Uh, Birdman, he's got a review in there. We're going to go into the news. Then we're going to have a couple uh, twin reviews for, for, in the middle from me, which are the new Sega Ages releases for the Nintendo Switch, which are Virtual Racing and a Wonder Boy arcade game. Uh, we're going to go into the weird news, and then we're going to sort of uh, segue into another review, which is from Birdman as well, and that is my friend Pedro. Uh, I think you might have seen him on social media talk about how he likes how delightfully weird it is. I haven't heard the review yet myself, but we'll be splicing that in here. And then I'm going to come back and just sort of close out the show and tell you what's coming up next. So without further ado, let's get into the first review. This is a fair request, and I promise I will not judge any person only as a teenager, and that this is no more right than saying all teenagers are drunken dope addicts or glue sniffers. Hey guys, Mike the Birdman Dodd here, and I'm here to take a look at some really cool RPG material brought to us by Modifius, and I'm looking at Achung Cthulhu, the Keeper's Guide and the Investigator's Guide, and uh, this is a really cool setting for the Call of Cthulhu uh, role-playing game, and it's more specifically for the 7th edition that came out a little while back, and what this does, it takes... World War II and adds a mythos element to it. Not saying that, you know, certain events in World War II were caused by the mythos, but sort of adding what if scenarios and sort of adding weird Nazi occult science uh, to it too. So imagine if Hydra from the Marvel Cinematic Universe had had mythos inspired weapons at time. Like there's Nazi zombies in this, literally. And there's like Nazi occult weaponry and it, it's weird, but follow me through. So uh, before I go any further, I should mention I have not had a chance to play this mechanically because my role-playing group has taken a break for the summer, so I've only had a chance to read through this. But what I've read, I'm incredibly impressed with, simply because the research that the Modifius people do is incredibly in-depth. In fact, I'm pretty sure you could use this if you were writing a paper about World War II, if you were in high school or college, you could probably cite uh, some of the things that happened in this book. Like, hey, did you know during World War II in uh, England you couldn't wear certain types of clothes because they needed that material for, for the war front? I didn't know that. Stuff like that, or explain the different roles of women 
from very various different countries, and just explaining how the home front work, the uh, stuff like war wives, uh, profiteering, uh, just basically all these little facets to make your campaign come alive during the World War II setting. And it doesn't follow right through the end of World War II, so you don't get them dropping the bomb uh, in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The setting cuts off just before that, so you can tell a different ending to the World War if you really wanted to. But one of the things the book does specifically is it says, don't say certain Nazi atrocities happened because of the mythos. No, it actively says don't do that because humans are evil in and of themselves. We don't necessarily need something to push us over the edge. We have that inside of us ourselves. But it's saying, what if that type of evil is drawn to the mythos regardless? And I thought that was actually a quite clever way to kind of frame things. Like, you're not going to blame the concentration camps on Yog sagoth or anything like that, but it's what to say, what if there were some German scientist working on the V-2 rocket who maybe had some inspiration from some dark entity from beyond the veil? Stuff like that. And I'm thinking, okay, that, all right, I dig it. And I also like how they kind of dug into the Nazi weird science, stuff like that. It gives you a ton of information on weaponry of the time, but the best thing about Achon Cthulhu is it really flushes out the setting. If you want a really authentic, historically accurate setting, you are getting something incredibly rich here, incredibly worth it. Um, you can pick up uh, the PDFs uh, for the for the two for under 40 bucks Canadian as of right now, and I think that's a fantastic value. If your Call of Cthulhu group is looking for something to be a little bit different, rather than always playing 1920s investigators, maybe you've done the Delta Green stuff, Maybe give Achun Cthulhu a whirl and check it out and maybe bring your uh, investigators to the fronts of World War II and uh, have something a little bit different as they maybe invade the beaches of Dunkirk or Normandy. Maybe, Maybe something strange lurks beneath the waves. Need a new weapon in your battle against evil? Check out LibrisArcana.com for Canada's premier RPG dice subscription service for only $7.97 Canadian with free shipping. You can get a new complete set of role-playing dice from D4s to D20s delivered straight to your door. Dice themes are new each month and can be anything your mind can imagine and beyond. Visit LibrisArcana.com and subscribe for only $7.97 Canadian with free shipping and be prepared to open up new worlds of adventure. News on the mark! been a bit of a slow news week uh this week as far as regular news so we've only got a couple quick ones here for you uh but we do have more when we get to it in the weird news section uh so let's just start out start out with halloween 2 and i'm putting in quotes because it's like i don't know how many halloween movies there is but the sequel to uh the last release where they brought back jamie lee curtis uh, is an october 2020 release uh with jamie lee curtis and david gordon green returning uh so this is brought to us by indie wire uh, it says here, after Jason Bloom teased earlier this month that he was discussing stuff with Jamie Lee Curtis, Collider now reports that the sequel to the duo's 2018 Halloween reboot uh, is gearing for a September film shoot. Uh, multiple sources tell Collider uh, production start is set for Labor Day holiday. Um, and it says here, many of the talents are going to return, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so... That's interesting. It made seventy six million the last one in theaters, which is a big boost compared to the previous ones that had come out. So I believe it was a sequel in it was like a true sequel to the original. I think they're ignoring some of the stuff. It's confusing. The timeline gets a little weird, but it is cool to see Jamie Lee Curtis back and there's not a whole lot of roles for women in their sixties anymore. Uh and, and especially not in horror, and she's one that is 
like so synonymous with the franchise that it's perfect having her in it. So I'm going to have to go back, I guess, and watch the last release because I haven't seen it yet. That might be something for me to do come Halloween time, maybe actually watch all of the Halloween movies. So moving along from that, and I know, first of all, I know that Birdman will be super psyched about that too. Now, our next story, which is, uh, I believe, going to be probably our final, unless I find something very quickly at the end here, <laughs> uh, is McDonald's Canada is going to experiment with wooden cutlery. Uh, move after comes after sweeping plastic bans announced in Canada. So this is from CBC News. This is our national government, like news, uh, publicly funded news. It says here, uh, McDonald's restaurant in Vancouver will soon be testing the company's greener packaging initiatives, serving wooden cutlery, paper straws, and other uh, recycling-friendly packaging. The fast food giants move uh, in the latest wave of announcements from major chains pledging to reduce their reliance on plastics, blah, 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 green earth. Good, good, good. Uh, this new McDonald's green concept restaurant will be at three four uh, 3,444 uh, East Hastings Street in Vancouver. It's one of two in Canada that will test out the environmentally friendly packaging. The other location is in London, Ontario. That's a hell of a lot closer to us. So it's like a 45 minute to an hour, hour and a half drive. This summer, diners at the restaurants uh, will see wooden cutlery, stir sticks, blah, blah. Well, stir sticks were already, oh, I guess they went from wooden to plastic a long time ago. So anyway, that's pretty cool. So they're going to, I guess, test it in Canada. And then it says here, if it becomes a big success, they might actually start rolling it out in the States. Because I know California already has a ban against it, but it might just be easier not to have to rely on multiple sources for things. They might go, hey, it's working great in Canada. Let's just order it in bulk and then roll it out in the States further if it, if it doesn't turn out to be a big disaster. Vancouver is a good start because it's it's the hippy-dippy uh, city of Canada. So there, And then London is more of a central large population, you know, 600,000 people or so. It's, you know, it's, it's bigger than Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Guelph, unless you combine all of our communities together, but it's smaller than Toronto. So it's a good place to start it, I guess. So that'll be interesting. And oh yeah, so there is one little story here and it's more of a news story. If you're into wrestling, uh, WWE has announced that Eric Bischoff their the formal, former guy who headed up WCW, their main rival in the nineties. Uh, has been signed on to a non like not television role, but like a behind the scenes role, taking on the uh, basically as the head of SmackDown Creative, uh, and then Paul Heyman has now been named head of uh, Raw Creative. They're doing that obviously to curb all the bad press they've been getting in the low viewership numbers leading into their uh, competition with AEW, and then uh, just overall viewership has dropped like fifty percent in the last year, year and a half. Uh, just poor product, bad marketing. Uh, it seems like they were in a big slump, but they obviously people were like, why are they putting Heyman on Raw and and Bischoff on SmackDown when they've sort of run the opposites in the past? Makes sense because Eric Bischoff is somebody who knows corporate uh, television, has done it for years, is the only person that ever really ran real competition to them. And he's probably going to be like a middleman that can go between Fox when SmackDown goes to Fox in the fall and the main company. So he can sort of be the liaison. He knows the TV side of things, how to schmooze up to them. And he knows the, the wrestling side of things so that he can sort of be a person that can bridge their gap. That's pretty smart. So we'll see. It's probably going to be a few weeks till we see any major change there. But uh, I guess that, that is, you know, big in the wrestling world. There's also going to be big news, I guess, for television because uh, there could be a seismic shift in the way that that, that kind of programming is presented. So that's going to do it for the news. Like I said, it's pretty short. We're going to come back with uh, a review uh, of the next Sega Ages titles, which are the Virtual Racing uh, and the Wonder Boy game. So we'll come back with that and then come back with the new weird news after that. Do you have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. All that thought, it's crapper time. The next pair of releases from Sega's Sega Ages line on the Nintendo Switch are here, and I had a chance to review them a little early. 
Uh, as we've done with all the previous ones, I wanted to cover uh, in depth and, and beat as much of the games as I possibly could uh, to give you sort of, you know, my in depth thoughts on just how you know they present themselves compared to when, you know when they originally came out. Well, we've got a pair of releases here. One I have played in the arcades originally, and one I have not. The first one I'll talk about is uh, the new release of Wonder Boy Monsterland, uh, which was an arcade title. Like you may have played the uh, the you know Wonder Boy you know and, and the the Monster World uh, titles on the Genesis uh, or other platforms in the past, and this is a very different experience. This is an arcade title that uh, basically you go from screen to screen, and each screen has like a mini boss or a boss. And you have a certain amount of time to actually kill the enemies, collect enough uh, money to you know upgrade your weapons or armor, and then beat whatever boss is there to move on to the next screen, and so on and so forth. If you die, you just insert a new coin and start back at the beginning and try to go farther and farther. I got um, I got stuck a few times, and it took me a several hours to probably beat uh, the vast majority of this, which is. You know, a, a welcome break from the usual, uh, like, instant kill. You're not going to instantly die. You have an option of selecting either three, four, or five hearts as your, your, your I guess, health meter, <laughs> for lack of a better term. But you don't die from, you know, even one hit. It's like two hits take away a heart sort of thing. So, you know, when you have five hearts, you get about five to ten hits before you die, which is pretty good. Uh, when you do die, you sort of... You can continue from where you were with whatever items you had at the last screen you started. So if you bought anything in the pre in like your previous playthrough that you didn't get to the next screen with, uh, you'll have to do that over again. But if you did carry it forward to the next you know level or screen, you'll get to start with those again. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's the standard stuff that M2's put into here with the graphics wise, as far as including uh, like scanline modes, stretching, all that sort of stuff, nice borders, all that sort of fun stuff. Now, uh, as far as a fun arcade game, it's pretty good. If you're a fan of uh, the series, you're going to want to pick it up. If you're not, uh, it is fairly challenging, but I found that the more and more I played each screen, the easier it got for me. So it does uh, take a little bit of skill and finesse to jump around and platform properly, but at the same time, it feels like when you die, it's your fault. There does Nothing in this game feels cheap and like you know forced upon you or anything so uh, it's pretty cool but uh, i'm gonna get to the next game Th that's a good game it's worth it checking it out uh if you're unsure check out a video on youtube but as far as uh between these two games the second game i'm going to talk about is probably th the better game overall and that is virtual racing now you may have played virtual racing on the genesis it had uh, a f i think it's the only game on the genesis that had a built-in extra chip, sort of like the Super Nintendo did, where it had an enhanced graphics chip. Now, I'm talking about the original arcade version, which is in widescreen mode, and if I remember correctly, I think there was a widescreen version, because it even, it, it states in the game that there, it's, it's in super wide mode, or whatever it's called, and it's an actual, like, Sega logo on it, so I'm assuming that there were widescreen monitors for this game, which I don't remember playing, but I do remember playing uh, this at Palladium uh, in Mississauga, when they still had I think it was, it was actually called like Sega World or something. I can't remember the name of it anymore, but before Palladium became a separate thing and then Cineplex, the movie theater chain, bought it, it was actually sponsored by Sega and it was like a multi-platform, like as, as in like multi-story with hundreds and hundreds of arcade games, like giant arcade, uh, I guess, theme park. And I remember playing uh, also at the CNE, the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto when it first launched and I was like five or six when it came out. Uh... And I got to sit in the cab and do all the crazy, uh, you know, steering where it even moved the cab around and everything, sort of like OutRun, which is really cool because this was the first major 3D uh, racing game. There had been, you know, one from Atari, I think, a few years earlier, but this is the first one that actually felt good uh, with polygons that actually, you know, resembled what they were supposed to resemble. And, uh, you know, it, it holds up quite well. In fact, playing it at uh, 1080p is pretty fantastic. It's not what you would expect from... Uh, a game from that era in that it it handles very well. Uh, you can select either to have uh, automatic or manual transmission. I suggest automatic to start because then you can sort of get a feel for the, how the game works. Um, 
It even has like the ring girls that come out to wave you on, which is hilarious because they're made up of like five polygons. <laughs> uh, but it basically, it's a faithful recreation of the original game in the widescreen mode. So it's not stretched or anything. It's in a natural widescreen mode, which it might be one of the first arcade games that was in widescreen. So, you know, predating a lot of things by at least 10 years, which is pretty darn cool. So you get, you only have one car. You can select your color if you play it in Grand Prix mode where you have 20 laps instead of 5 laps per level. Uh, at the harder difficulties, it can get really difficult, but you can adjust your difficulties here and there. And there's even a, a helper assist mode, which uh, when you turn that on, it means that you can p basically pass through the other cars without bumping into them and like flipping out and stuff. Only thing is, it doesn't tell you it though. When you enable that mode, you can't get anything above 4th or 6th place, depending on the race you're playing in. So, like, I would lap people. I was getting so good. I'm like, why Why can I not get 3rd, 2nd, or 1st? It won't let you. It doesn't say that in the game, but the second you turn off that mode, you can then complete it like normal. I think it's sort of a way to not make the game so easy that you cheat. It's sort of to get you used to playing and get better at it, because then you can turn it off and actually complete the races and win. Uh, there's practice modes, there's online modes, there's leaderboards. Uh, it's it's a pretty fun arcade game, and it's one that I would think is going to do really well on the Switch because there's a lack of really good racing games in general that are just arcade fun games. They're, everything's gone to the way of full simulator, so this sort of fills the void, you know, especially at the you know, $10, $15 price point that these uh, Sega Ages games uh, launch at. So... Between the two, I would say if you're only going to be able to pick one, go with the uh, virtual racing game. And if you are a big fan of just arcade games in general, they're both really good ports. I didn't find any glitches. The sound is great. It has that great Sega feel. So uh, I would say check up both of them. But you know, my recommendation is a for sure buy virtual racing. makes you qualified to be a reporter. I'm willing to violate anyone's privacy for my personal gain and then claim with a straight face that the public has a right to know. By the hand of Zeus, what manner of deviltry is this? I love fake alien poop day. For the weird news, we got a few of them this week, more than we had of the regular news, and it's been strange to be, I guess, precise. Uh, we'll start with uh, one that is brought to us by uh, WCVB uh, 5ABC, and it says here, bear enters home and settles in for a nap in the closet. There's a picture of a bear sitting on top of, that's a big bear, sitting on top of a closet uh, hanger. Uh, it says here, authorities say a black bear somehow locked itself inside a Montana home and nestled onto a, a closet shelf that wasn't too hard and wasn't too soft, but was just right for a nap. <laughs> I like when they do that. Uh, it says here, Missoula County Sheriff's officials say the bear yawned when deputies knocked on the window, unlocked the door, and attempted to coax it to leave. They had to call Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Department officials who tranquilized the bear so it could be re relocated. Just a, a little funny quick one. You can imagine coming home, you go to hang your coat up, and you're like, there's a fucking bear in there. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, our next story is uh, another one brought to us by CBC. Now, it says here, did Canuck the Crow swoop off with a knife from a Vancouver crime scene? And there is a picture of a crow holding a knife in its mouth, and it, it's literally like come at me bro it could take on that crab any day 
It says here, Canuck the Crow, Vancouver's most notorious bird, is being accused of flying away with a knife from a crime scene. The crow has quite a reputation in Vancouver, and its antics are regularly chronicled on social media, including a dedicated Facebook page and a profile photo of the bird holding a knife in its beak. Earlier today, uh, it says police had shot a man near Hastings and Kessler Street. Uh, they were called to the scene of an engul- of a car engulfed in flames. When they arrived, police said they were confronted by a man with a knife. Shots fired, and the man was arrested. Uh, v- uh, Vancouver Courier reporter uh, Mike Howell has said that the bird, uh, which had a red tag on his leg, uh, as does Canuck, Swoop, uh, swooped in and picked up an object from inside the area of, cordoned off by the police with tape. A cop chased it for about 15 to 20 feet, and then the, and the crow <laughs> dropped it and took off. Uh, it says here, it was really strange. In my 20 plus years of reporting from crime scenes, I've never seen anything like this, a crow trying to take a, a, a murder knife away. It says here, Vancouver police confirmed the bird did indeed take off with crime scene evidence. Oh, God. That's a, that's a smart-ass, scary-ass bird. So, I mean, is it going to beat Pizza Rat, though? I don't know. Toronto's got Pizza Rat. Pizza Rat's there forever. So then our next story is, what do we have here? So this is from inews.co.uk. Jersey is being terrorized by 100 strong gangs of feral chickens waking up locals and chasing joggers. Um, Okay. And that's that's pretty much all the story has to it. It just says that there people are walking along paths and there's hundreds of chickens just clucking and trying to attack them. So it's like the birds, I guess, but with chickens. So that was just a quick one. But yes, um, England. What the fuck? <laughs> and then from the Miami Herald. Oh, this will be good. Come on, Florida. Come on, Florida. Uh, it says, a burglary suspect threw his own feces at a Miami judge. Then the jury acquitted him. What? 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 A Miami criminal trial was delayed briefly Friday when the accused man defecated, so he shit the, on the ground, and cast feces inside the courtroom. So he just shit on the ground, picked it up, and threw it across. Wait, it says arguments were... What? It was a burglary trial. The excrement uh, from the accused uh, was aimed but did not reach the Miami-Dade circuit judge. Lawyers fled. County police officers, correction officers, swarmed the courtroom. It's protein. It's good for you. He yelled over and over again as th- as he was throwing the feces. <laughs> the incident happened during a routine morning court calendar. No jurors were on hand yet. Uh, it just says here he was eventually acquitted for the crime, which is ridiculous. So yes, okay, okay. Uh, he's my hero <laughs> it's protein it's good for you yeah take my shit bitch <laughs> so uh <laughs> there's not much more i can say there except florida does not disappoint ever and that's just gonna do it for the weird news this week uh I, i'm fully assuming next week we're gonna have a shit ton of weird news uh, being Canada Day celebrations, 4th of July. And, you know, we're going to be looking for Florida to save us again and hopefully some part of rural Canada because that can be kind of weird too. But that's going to be it for the weird news. Basically, you're geeks. Leave me alone, geek boy. Holy shit, you geeks are badass. Hey guys, Mike the Birdman Dodd here, and I'm here with a review for the Nintendo Switch game, My Friend Pedro, coming to us from Dead Toast Entertainment and Devolver Digital. This is a game that I recently became aware of because of E3 and the incredibly weird uh, Devolver press conference, which is always a plus for every year that these guys show up, and I didn't quite know what to expect, so I got this game, and based upon the trailers, it just looked like a side-scrolling shooter. Didn't quite know what to what to expect with it. But what I got was a mix. What if John Wick and The Matrix had a baby and it was stupid? And I don't mean that in a bad way. No. Picture all the cool bullet time mechanics of The Matrix, 
mixed with the insane gun slinging action of the John Wick franchise, and you have my friend Pedro, except your friend is a banana. Yeah, bullets, bananas, blood, or however the tagline for this game goes. But it's a really cool side scrolling uh, 2D platformer shooter with bullet time mechanics and there's a really neat puzzle elements to it too where basically you might have to flip a switch shoot the floor so there's laser stops going or activate an elevator by bouncing off a wall it's it's gonna tease your brain as well as your fingers in fact your fingers get quite a workout in this game as i've discovered but it's a really really fun game that i found is best not binged if you play this game in chunks, because the levels are really short, where if you wanted to just play a couple of levels and then call it a day and then come back at it later, you can do that. You can also replay levels trying to get better uh, scores and times through it, more trick kills, stuff like that. You do get extra points for saying jumping through a window, grabbing a rope, bouncing off a wall, bouncing a bullet off like a frying pan, or kicking someone's severed head uh, into them, or hitting them with a basketball or a knife or whatever. It's ridiculous. It sounds insane. And that's what this game is. It's insane, but fun. I couldn't believe how much fun I had with this game. Uh, My Friend Pedro is one of those rare games where I'm glad I have it on the Switch because this is something I could easily see being played portable if I'm bored on a commute somewhere or if I want to play it at home on the big screen. I feel just as at home in both environments. So can I recommend My Friend Pedro for the Nintendo Switch? Absolutely. If you like shooters and platformers, this game's going to scratch that itch. It's got just enough of a puzzle element too. And if you can get through this game and stick with it and get to the very end, it gets weird. It gets really, really weird. So stick with it. I think you'll enjoy it. My friend Pedro from Dead Toast Entertainment and Devolver Digital. Those magnificent bastards. Color me kooky, but something very odd is going on around here. You're not allowed to talk anymore. And that is it for the show this week. So, you know, if you're in Canada and you're celebrating Canada Day, make sure that, uh, you know, you drive, you know, drive safe, don't drink and drive, party, you know, in moderation with friends, relax, enjoy, have a good time, just even decompress for the weekend, don't do anything. Uh, and the same goes for our American friends that are happening, happen midweek to the end of the week with 4th of July, you know, stay safe, have fun. You know, light off some fireworks just not at my window like my fucking neighbors did <laughs> uh and you know just sit back and enjoy the true beginning of summer and yes car that decided to honk like crazy outside hopefully my mic didn't pick it up because i'm gonna try to fucking noise cancel it anyway that's enough rambling here as far as what we're doing this week uh like i said earlier uh birdman and i have a friend coming up from the states so we're gonna hang out midweek uh, at the end of the week, we're going to be recording a show. Birdman said he's going to be back. I'm going to hold him to it. And if he's not, uh, you can you can yell at him, I guess. Yell at him, yes. Uh, we're also going to be uh, on Saturday. Uh, we're going to be recording and live streaming with the Terrible Warriors and Cambridge Chronicles our next uh, hour as we start to get into uh, the game of Shadowrun. So that's going to be fun. And we'll, of course, tweet out and, and throw up links and everything for how to you know watch us play live we're going to try to do that i think it's between nine and ten o'clock or so nine ten thirty uh pretty much every other saturday so that's going to be really neat and that's going to be it right now we, i know i've got a turn of treasure in the works because i have a few reviews coming i've got um death's gambit to talk about i also have uh monster jam the new monster truck game i'm working on a review for that uh, i also just received a few movies in the mail the beach bum uh the what's the one called escape plan three uh and i also received what was the third one there oh yeah double impact the the van damme movie from uh, vd they're putting out one of those really high-end uh, collector's series blu-rays of it so i'm going to be checking that out uh, i know birdman has some stuff on the go i think he's working on crash team racing not 100% sure. I think he's got a few things like that on the go. 
and there's going to be some neat releases coming up very soon. So, uh, you know, be sure to stick around. We'll let you know when we have those reviews out for you. So that's going to be it. Again, I'm going to say um, live free or die hard, whatever Birdman says. Uh, see you people later. Well, that's our show. All right, here's the deal. Every time you watch my show, I will send you $40. Checks will not be honored. You've been listening to This Week in Geek, your source for guaranteed nonsense or your money back. Tune in next week for more info on the most important things you didn't need to know. Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net and subscribe to our podcast through iTunes or any podcatcher. If you'd like to comment on this episode, head over to this episode's post at thisweekingeek.net and leave a comment through Facebook Connect. Follow us on Twitter at thisweekingeek.net and follow our Instagram at twig underscore official underscore podcast. Social media not your thing? Send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. We'll see you next time, and remember... Lower your shields and surrender your listenership. Just when you think this show is terrible, something wonderful happens. What? It ends. (laughs) I have to go. Somewhere there is a crime happening. My apologies, sir, but the sale of fireworks is prohibited in this state and is punishable by... Follow me. Celebrate the independence of your nation by blowing up a small part of it.